uh, suddenly we're all together at the same place of need before the one who loves us most and invites us into that place of encounter. And I just, I'd like to just pause for a few moments just for each one of us to just ponder what was God speaking to me in that place of worship, that place of preparation to receive. Let's just be quiet in the presence of the Lord. Lord, one of the things I hear you speaking to me that's personal and corporate is that we're uncomfortable with spaces of silence. At least many of us are because we have business to do. We have agendas to cover. We have things to get done. And we acknowledge before you that we want to quiet our souls and to hear from you. In places of solitude, in places of interaction, would you open our ears to hear what we cannot hear without your Spirit's breath blowing on us? Would you put our eyes to see in the Spirit what we cannot see without a touch from you? To heal our physical eyes to see spiritually in new ways. Lord, I ask for whatever you were speaking in individuals' lives that they would receive that, treasure it, and allow it to transform them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Marcia, I'll, I'll invite you up here as well. We're going to tag team teach. This is the first time we've done this. Uh, uh, you might see my face uh, more than you see uh, Marcia's. Reality is that she does twice as much work as I do to get things ready. Um, you all know that how that works. Um, but as, as we I already shared, as we spent time, particularly Marcy and I, but the, as the Bishop Elder team, uh, this sense of kingdom just kept rising. And uh, when it first stirred in me, my first response was, we all know kingdom. We, we, we've, we've studied this for many of us since we were a child, right? And yet I felt like the Spirit of God was stirring something in me that was an invitation to deeper and in some ways, maybe more simple. Last uh, year at uh, Celebration of Church Life, uh, Spring Leadership Assembly, um, there was uh, in, input around the invitation, around following always more, some visual images for that, uh, some pictures that some of you have, have, have worked with. But it was an invitation of our life to more fully surrender to God. And this past year, uh, as a bishop elder team, as we've engaged with that, uh, this sense of, and we've been doing work along with the with the bishop uh, bishop board as well as the conference executive council around uh, identifying core values. And there's ones that we're testing. For me, there are more than words; there are concepts that are important for movement at this point. And three of those that have really have really been stirring me: one is delight, one is follow, and one is surrender. Uh, in some ways progressive, uh, though I would acknowledge that my first encounter with Christ as a young disciple in a more rigid way of thinking in the Mennonite church was not delight, but fear. Um, a fear-based response to the one who loves me most, which seems a bit strange, and yet these things happen in cultural contexts. And so uh, in that in that. Uh, that whole thing of delight really is in many ways connected to a verse that has been speaking to me again and again in this last year. And uh, that I want to project here for us, um, if we can get our projecting uh, stuff to flow here. Uh, please move this window away from the shared. There you go. Good. Um, thank you. But this from the amplified uh, version of uh, Luke 12, 31 through 32 uh, says, but strive for and actively seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. And then these words that he spoke to his disciples, do not be afraid and anxious, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And that's really been something that for some time now has been stirring my heart, almost as if, as if the Father is wooing me to that place of, of, of connection, not being afraid, not being anxious, 
that I and we are that little flock, but that it is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. And that phrase just kept stirring in me. His pleasure is to give us the kingdom. And if that's the case, it means that I have to understand what that kingdom is to be able to say, I want to receive what that is. Marcia, we talked about this in, in the context as you've been thinking about this word of God's delight, pleasure, whatever. What thoughts have been going through your mind? Uh, what has helped you visualize that? Whoops, too far. So I don't know if you know, but um, Keith Blank's wife is an artist. And so um, Keith had shared with me a couple of images that she was currently working on. And um, when we first saw this, um, it was slightly different. And so we went back to Brenda and said, could you just, just change it just a little bit? And she did, and she added some light and um, different faces, and, and it just represented for us the kingdom. So Keith, I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about that, but this yeah. image has really drawn us in. Well, I think again, back to this place of, 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 of delight is really uh, a lot of ways for me, one of these things that I've been kind of on a pilgrimage around what I would call uh, left brain Christianity and uh, embracing a, a, an integrated uh, place of, 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 that, of that understanding, both sides of our mind, left brain, very ordered, you figure it out, you know right and wrong, you tell people right and wrong or whatever, and right brain, which is much more relational. It has mystery, it is beauty, it is creative in that context. And these two merge together in a beautiful way. And so one of the things we've been trying to do is say, where can we create images that uh, within LMC we begin to activate both because one's not pitted against the other. They're both connected as a part of our connecting with God. And this image of, of, of the delight of, of, of God and, and uh, God's children is so powerful. And uh, for us also within the Bishop Elder team, a recognition that though this, this gathering here is still very white, it is not representative of the whole of what LMC is becoming. And so we keep asking the Lord, how might, how might we grow into that? How might that, that, uh, that uh, be shifted and, and change? I think, Keith, this image for us really represents the Father's delight mm -hmm. in each one of us. Um, it just draws us in and engages us in a completely different way that's, that's more right-brained mm -hmm. and experiential, um, but just information. So may God, may God do that in our midst uh, in these uh, days, weeks, months, and years to come. May there be an activation. And there is the original is up here. I always say originals are the best uh, thing to look at. So sometime during the day, you might want to just glance at that if there's something that stirs you or something you're sensing either back to us or to the prophetic listening team as a part of what is God speaking to us uh, as we gather together. And so as I, as I spent time uh, with, this, with this passage, I really felt like the Lord led me into what I would call basic kingdom principles uh, and diving into those afresh. And I'm not going to take too much time uh, on this for the sake of, sake of time, uh, but this whole thing of, uh, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do we understand the kingdom? And this, this Greek word uh, for kingdom, uh, basileia, uh, refers to the realm in which the king sovereignly rules and reigns. That's the essence of that word. And so even when John Wycliffe first translated to English, everybody knew what a kingdom was. It was the place where that king who was sovereign ruled and reigned. Some were good and some were bad. But a recognition of what that was, that's not part of our understanding. We can say, well, we kind of know what a kingdom is, but experientially that has not necessarily been a part <clears throat> of, our, of, our, of our lives or our understanding. And so the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this heavenly realm already has the right to rule and reign over the entire universe. Not just the whole earth, but the whole, whole, whole universe. That is established that this kingdom has a king who has the right to rule and reign. And you might say, that's too simple, Keith. And uh, that's the point. It's not that complex. So that's the first one. The second one on this is that God's rule and reign results in restoration and reconciliation. 
And it's interesting, uh, Mackenzie, some of your songs so tied in with this theme of of the drawing in, but the restoration, the being 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 reconciled to God. Uh, but this king, the, the triune God that we worship, is at his core a God of restoration and reconciliation. And as we truly encounter God, there is first a reconciliation and restoration between us and God. And that results in the restoration of our true identity. And we talked earlier about identity. That truth is, who really am I? Am I who I think I am? Or is there stuff that God has deposited in you and me that I don't, we don't yet see? And sometimes it's the sister or the brother that calls it out and says, Dave, you've got a prophetic eye. You see things in the spirit. Now, you know that, but the reality is at some at one point, you didn't know what to do with that. It was a journey of discovering what God had deposited in you and me, and that this is part of that discovery of, of what who I really am, how God sees me, and that he delights over me and over you. And so the question is, how does this happen? And the reality is that it first has to be embraced that God rules and reigns, that's a foundational truth of this kingdom, and that his rule and reign is about restoration and reconciliation. And we could start to say, how do we audit what we're doing as a church? Because if it's not about restoration and reconciliation, are we engaging in things that we maybe shouldn't be giving all our energy to? And might the possibilities of restoration and reconciliation be infinite of how that might happen in your life or your life or my life? based on what God has deposited in us. And as we embrace this kingdom, our thoughts, our actions, and even our very lives begin to express his heart expression for the kingdom. The aroma of Christ begins to flow out from us, and wherever we go, there's this sense of, that's something that I want to know more about, the person who sees that. Um, I just came back last week from a, what I call a learning journey in Bulgaria. Manny's the only one here so far. The others will be here later this afternoon uh, as a part of that. But just one of the things that we experienced again was with my friend Hari Atanasov uh, in Bulgaria was this man who everywhere he goes, the aroma of Christ goes with him. And I said, I want, I want to change. I want to, I want to become more like Hari in the way that he follows Christ. And then lastly, before I, I turn it uh, over to you, uh, Marcia, for some more input, um, uh, maybe one, one additional comment, we, don't, we can leave it there, it's still in the second one, is this whole arena of Matthew 6.33, uh, again from the Amplified, says it this way, but first and most importantly, seek or aim or strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of, of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God, and all these things shall be added on to you. And it's interesting that Matthew notes two things that we're to seek or aim to or strive after. God's kingdom, his rule and reign in our lives, and his righteousness. And I think it's important to understand that second one, his righteousness. That's, uh, and uh, this is not judgment, it's just saying what, where I was at. That's not what I experienced as a young man growing up in Lancaster County. I had to be righteous to be accepted. And the Father couldn't delight over me unless I did everything right. And so in that context, I felt ashamed and embarrassed that I wasn't as perfect as everyone else. And it wasn't until I encountered the one who delights in me and loves me that it began to change the way I live. But you know what? Those old memories still haunt me because my patterns still go back to those at times depending on how intense it is. In church, you know what? We have to do better. Not do better in that, but be better. Because being with the one who loves us most allows us to experience his righteousness and actually share his righteousness, not our righteous efforts with others. And then lastly, I have here, God has chosen us as kingdom citizens to be heralds and ambassadors. So, for whatever reason, God in his infinite wisdom said, I'm going to pick you, 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 I say all of you, whoever surrenders and says, I want more of you, and I'm going to use you to be my representatives. As it says in, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, as though God were making his appeal through us. And I want to tell God sometimes, couldn't you thought of a better plan? And the response is, it is the best plan, son, because you and this daughter 
and that son and that daughter, every one of you, as you're transformed by my nature, you represent the possibility for others of what it means to be restored and redeemed and to be an ambassador of that restoration and redemption wherever you go. Marcy. Yeah, thank you, Keith. Um, as many of you are familiar, LMC chooses a passage to dwell in each year. And this year, the dwelling in the word passage is John 15. And this ties right in along, right along with, with what we're talking about as kingdom. So we're going to pause for 30 seconds while you have that conversation with Jesus. And for me, the best answer I can come up with when Jesus asked Marcia, do you love me? I just use Peter's words and I say, Lord, you know my heart. You know all things. You know that I love you. Having a, a little technical difficulties with the mic, hopefully, uh, this is this is better now. <clears throat> Last um, just understanding of of kingdom foundational understanding is that Jesus has already inaugurated this kingdom, and I I'm I'm always fascinated by the account in Luke uh, chapter four, um, and uh, particularly fascinated because uh, in the chosen episode where they recount this, I'm just fascinated by what happens in that context, but uh, Jesus is just uh, coming back from the desert after being tempted by, by, the, 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 enemy, the, by the, the, the devil, the enemy. And it says, and Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee and reported about him, and reports about him went out, went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of a sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at his gracious words that were coming from his mouth. This sense of it, it's the Messiah. But can we trust him? Do we want to trust him? It might mess up all of our church synagogue structures. And he might actually love people that we don't love, which is what happens in the, on, in, the, in the subsequent part of this passage. But the key here is that Jesus clearly declared that inauguration of his kingdom. It was fulfilled. And in that place, that fulfillment draws us into this place to say it was fulfilled then, the inauguration of it coming in, it, it, we talk about the is but is not yet in fullness concept of kingdom, but it's here. God's inviting us. Actually, his great pleasure is to give us the kingdom, but it's going to require us understanding it in new, simple, practical ways. For us to become a movement, I believe this is going to be one of those key things that God just keeps stirring, keeps niggling, keeps, keeps growing in us the understanding of kingdom. We have uh, for you a couple of uh, questions here that uh, uh, are they on the table as well or yeah so they're on your tables for those uh, will for those that are on online breaking into uh, cluster groups we're going to take uh, 10 minutes on this I know we're behind time but we'll we'll work with this what fruits are produced by citizens of an earthly kingdom versus fruits by the citizens of the heavenly kingdom compare and contrast the differences between serving as friends of Jesus versus servants slaves of Jesus and identify the difference in the produced fruit and then as a network of churches, LMC has declared this is our ultimate allegiance, that Jesus is Lord of absolutely everything. How does this change the way we live individually and as faith communities? You can go to any one of those questions, wherever you want to go, but uh, the, 
the Zoom groups will go into, into breakout groups and that will be 10 minutes. So you have 10 minutes. At 10 minutes, uh, I'll signal in some way, you're free to go to break and uh, then we'll come back. So thank you. If I could have everybody in the next minute again, end, end your sentence Actually, healthily. As I was, I was meandering around, interacting with people and overhearing conversations, if we did nothing else but gather and talk like we were, we would have accomplished so much about what the kingdom is. And I, I just love to watch the interaction. Um, I, I see in some ways kind of a, a shift in that I see more and more of a younger generation. Now I'm 60, so everything looks younger generation now. Um, but a recognition that God is stirring something here that is very profound. It's beyond any kind of structure we can create. But it is about a fellowship, a caring for one another, a iron sharpening iron. I mean, everything that's shared and talked about, believe me, because I know I'm not a theologian, it's not perfect. It's flowing from the heart of what God is stirring amongst the bishop, bishop elder team. And for now, the sense was this center around kingdom, which lines in with this ultimate allegiance and saying, you know what? We have a lot of other gods out there that we worship because we happen to be a part of a nation that has some pretty powerful gods. Okay, at least I got one amen. In the midst of just before COVID, um, I was in a regional pastor's prayer gathering. I was some other Mennonite pastors, but a, a broad scope and was sitting out in my back deck praying and, and with them. And, and all of a sudden, what I sensed in my spirit was the Lord said, I'm going to expose the idols of the American church. And I started arguing with God. Because I've said I've been in the Buddhist world. I've been in the Hindu world. I know what idols look like. And I thought like the Lord said, no, these are much bigger than those idols. Now, I don't even know how to describe all that. And I only share that to say we're in a place where Jesus as Lord will be challenged at every level of what we try to do as a church. Or at least not say what we try to do, at least what we're being called to become as the church. And that ultimate allegiance of Jesus as Lord, that will get audited and challenged every day because of the culture we live in. It's not a popular message. This is not one that somebody's going to make a lot of money off of. And if they do, then they're not preaching the gospel. I, I, I'm not judging anyone. I'm just saying the reality of what's there. I, he's supposed to be teaching, not me. So um, <laughs> you got enough from me. William, come here. I, I didn't know this man very well until I became a bishop elder. But this man is a gift to this movement. Steadfast, a student, a teacher with a prophetic edge. The prophetic in him is going to find the things that need to be addressed and worked at. His, his title, um, I lost already because I was shuffling my notes around. I, I can never remember it, but uh, <laughs> it's a really interesting one. Uh, I, I, I got it here. My oh, notes. Yeah. I actually okay. copied it off the website. Wow. Um, but in that context, his role as LMC resource staff in the area of theological education and specifically Anabaptist Christian identity formation. Anybody who can impact that can be in the club. No. Um, LMC resource staff in the area of theological education and specifically Anabaptist Christian identity formation. So much of what we work at as a Bishop Elder team, we'll bring back and say, does this make sense, William? Can you challenge us? Sometimes we get papers back and if he's the teacher, he corrects everything and we're like, oh, I didn't see that. Thank you, William. But I just want to honor this man. He doesn't, you don't see him a whole lot. He works tirelessly to get, prepare classes and online classes, things like that. Just led one that was very intense, not easy to be a part of a book study, but we need to have those kind of studies. So William, let me just pray with you and uh, I'll then shut my mouth and let you share. Lord, I thank you for my brother. I thank you for the ways in which William and who, who he is and what he carries is being elevated in the context, not to say everybody sees it, but elevated in importance for the purpose of 
a strong theological and really Anabaptist foundation to what we do. Not to make that more important than the Bible, but really for us, we see the Scriptures through that lens of Jesus' life and living it out with Jesus as Lord. And thank you that that is a passion of Williams. And so we bless him today as he shares uh, with us on some stuff that's very familiar to us, but I believe you'll open our eyes to some fresh revelation today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm super excited to be able to share with you about the first request of the Lord's Prayer, Hallowed Be Your Name. Uh, Keith and Marcia, we're talking about the second request of the Lord's Prayer, Your Kingdom Come, and we're going to jump now to the first request. And I think that this is one of the least understood of all the uh, petitions of the Lord's Prayer. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about what it means to pray this and what it's all about. And then I'll make some connections back to what Keith and Marcia shared about uh, the coming of the kingdom. So I want us to dig into the meaning of the request, and we're going to go through this in five successive steps to unpack what's going on in this short petition, Hallowed Be Your Name. And first of all, I want to say that this is not an offering of praise to God. You know that we're coming before God and saying, God, we hallow your name, we praise you. Not that that's a bad thing to do. I mean, Psalm 100 verse 4 tells us, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. But that's just not what we're doing with this first petition of the Lord's Prayer. Rather, this is, in fact, a request to God. Both Matthew and Luke, as they record the words of Jesus in Greek, uh, use a construction that's called uh, an a, a imperative of entreaty, which is simply a way of making a request. So it's clear that we're asking God for something. Second thing I want to say to you is that this phrase, hallowed be your name, and notice the passive tense here, hallowed be, is what's called a divine passive. This is a deferential, respectful way of talking about God that uses a passive grammatical construction, but has an active meaning. It means, God, hallow your name. So this, is a little, this is a little bit odd for us, but this is the way they talked in ancient Judaism, and it was probably a way of not saying the word God too often. You don't want to have that word on your lips too often, lest you take it in vain or use it in, in a wrong way. But then the question is, what does it mean to ask God to hallow God's own name? Well, in Scripture, a person's name stands for the person, their character and their identity. It has to do with their reputation and their renown, how they're seen by others and who they are. So we are asking God Show us who you are so that people will know who you are. Show us who you are so that people will know who you are. We're praying, God, make yourself known. People don't know who you are, God. They may not even know that you exist. So we're asking you to reveal yourself through your actions. And then fourth, we have the word hallow, which means to regard as sacred or holy. We don't use this word much anymore in English apart from Halloween, right? So all Hallow's Eve, that doesn't really help us very much in terms of understanding what this is about. Some people will use the transla translation sanctified be your name, but I'm not sure that gets us too far down the road toward understanding uh, either. The English word hallow comes from the word holy, which means set apart or different with the idea of special or better connected to it. So here's a simple example uh, for you of this from my mother's house where we had regular dishes that we used whenever we ate all the time. The regular dishes. They were easily accessible. Anyone could get a hold of them. And then there were the special dishes, which were only for when there was company or a big meal that was coming that was important to us. And these special and better dishes were kept set apart in a different place, which was a china cabinet in the dining room. And those only came out 
when something really special was about to take place. So it is with God's name. We're praying that people will see that God is different and better than all else. Whether we're talking about other gods or people or whatever you have in mind, God is in a class all God's own in terms of power and character. And then fifth, the idea is that when people see who God is, they will hallow God and they will hallow God's name. They'll see who God is and they'll respond appropriately in this way. Just to give you one example, uh, after God acted in deliverance at the Red Sea, Israel responded in this way in Exodus 15, 11, And I want you all to read it with me, please, all together. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? God is revealed when God acts and people respond with awe and wonder as God does his work in our midst. So putting this all together, we can say that this is a request, not a praise, for God to act, the divine passive, to reveal who God is, talking about God's name, so that people will see God's unique greatness and will respond with praise and honor and hallow God and God's name. Next, I want to share with you about this hallowing process. There's a process that's involved here and how God hallows his name. And there's three steps to this process. The first step is that God acts. And this is what we're asking God to do when we pray that first request of the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be your name. God, we want you to act to hallow your name. The hallowing process begins with God acting to do great things that show who God is. The second step is that God is made known through God's people. That is by acting for us and acting through us. This is how God usually works in the, in the world and it's the way that God wants to work in the world through his people, through us. There's this connection between us and God because we bear God's name. So when people look on who don't know the Lord, they see us bearing God's name. And, and when God acts for us to bless us, when God uses us as his instruments, when we act faithfully and represent God well, this reflects back on God. And the people can praise him as they see God in our lives. This is how God makes himself known to others. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3 says this, and I want you to read it with me. It's so important. Through those who are near me, I will show myself holy, and before all the people, I will be glorified. This is such an important principle in Scripture of how God works in the world. Through those who are near me, I will show myself holy, and before all the people, I will be glorified, or we could say hallowed. The third step of the process, the howling process, is those who see this come to know God and acknowledge God's greatness. They hallow God's name. The background of this petition is that the world doesn't know who God is, or has distorted understandings of who God is. In the context of idolatry in the ancient world in biblical times, the question was, who, who is the true God among the various gods? In our context today, uh, the, the situation is, does God exist? Is there a God out there? And if God exists, does God care about us? Is God interested in us and our lives? And so you see this request has a missional or evangelistic edge to it. We are praying that people who don't know who God is will see and come to know God and be in relationship with God and will glorify and praise God. Sometimes I want to say as well that this is a request for us as God's people because we forget how awesome and amazing God is. We get into our routines. We get into our ways of doing things. 
and we can shut God out and not see God moving among us like God wants to move among us. And sometimes we just need God to break out and remind us of who He is and to show us once again His awesome greatness. I want to look at Psalm 67 briefly as an example of this hallowing process. The psalmist here is, as is the case with us, praying for this process to take place. So first of all, in Psalm 61, verse 1 and 6, God, please act. In the particular context here, if I've got it right, is God, provide your people with a harvest. Provide for our needs. Second, make yourself known through us. Psalm 67, verse 2. To saying, provide that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. The third part of the process, so that all will come to know you and acknowledge your greatness. Psalm 67, verse 3, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The hallowing process. I want to look at this hallowing process in a little more detail with an example from Ezekiel excuse me, 36, which is perhaps the most detailed description of this process in all of Scripture. Ezekiel 36. Israel has been judged. They have gone off into exile. They have gone off into Babylon. But this has profaned God's name. And profaning the name is the exact opposite of hallowing the name. God says in Ezekiel 36, 20, when Israel came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name in that it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they had to go out of his land. So what does God do to fix this situation? What does God do in this context to hallow God's name? Well, first of all, God acts. Ezekiel 36, 22, I am about to act. God is going to do a great thing in their midst. And God isn't doing this for Israel's sake because they've been unfaithful. God is very clear in this chapter about this fact. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for my own name's sake and for my own glory. And specifically, God is going to act miraculously to bring Israel back from exile into the promised land. Second, God is made known through God's people. Verse 23, I will hallow my great name when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. That is almost a quote of Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3. When through you I display my holiness before their eyes. God's greatness will be seen as he gathers up his people and brings them back and reestablishes them in the promised land. And the result of this process is that those who see will come to know God and acknowledge God's greatness. We put all of verse 23 on the screen. It says, The nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. Notice again the missional piece of this request. Those who currently don't know God will come to see that Yahweh is the one true God. Now, in this example, in Ezekiel 36, God's people are unfaithful and God is acting despite that. But we know that God's heart is to use our faithfulness as we walk in God's way to bring forth glory to his name. Let me share with you now just a little bit about the versatility of this request and different ways that we can pray this. It can be prayed for the final day but it can also be prayed now for as we live our lives in this world. So for example, Father, hallowed be your name when on the final day every knee will bow before Jesus and glorify you. This is when God's full holiness will be revealed and we will all be amazed and in awe. 
or for today. Father, hallowed be your name as you do great things to accomplish your purposes in this world. As your spirit anoints us to proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and liberty to those who are oppressed. As God is working among us, bringing glory to his name. Also for the present, we can pray this individually, or we can also pray it corporately. So for instance, God, may your name be hallowed in my life this day. God, may your name be hallowed through our congregation or the network of congregations that are connected to us. And we can use different words as the Spirit leads us to pray this request to our Heavenly Father. Here are some variations of this request in other places in Scripture. For instance, Exodus 33, 18, Moses prayed, Please show me your glory. And I'm like, Moses, you are so courageous. Please show me your glory, God. If we understand what he's asking for there, we know that he's saying, God, I want to know more about you, your character and your power. I want you to reveal yourself to me so that I can be overwhelmed and amazed and in awe of who you are and what you're doing in this world. I just say God was merciful to Moses just to show him a little bit of his glory, which was really too much for him even then. Because we have to understand there is so much more to God than any of us can even imagine with our human minds. God's awesomeness and God's glory. But yes, please show us your glory, God, as you move among us and do your work. The psalmist asks in Psalm 57.5, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. The psalmist is praying for God to be uh, made known through God's actions so that all the people of the earth will know and honor and glorify God. And then we have Jesus praying this request in John 12, 28. As he's on his way to the cross, he says, Father, glorify your name. Even in the midst of the suffering and all the persecution and the pain, and all the shame that was about to come upon Jesus, he's still praying, in the midst of this, God, show everyone who you are, your character and your power. And so we see the suffering love of God through our Lord Jesus as he went to the cross. And we see the power of God as he raised him up from the dead and overcame the power of death. Father, glorify your name. And we see this all revealed as Jesus suffered and died and was raised for us. So we're not, we're not locked in to just praying, hallowed be your name. There are many ways to pray this request. The following are some ways that I regularly pray this request of the Lord's Prayer that I want to share with you. But as I do this, I want you to say it out loud with me, and as much as you can, I want you to make these your own prayers as we say them together. All right, so everybody get yourself in the right space, the right posture. We're gonna have a little prayer meeting here as we're going. We're gonna pray together to our Heavenly Father. Let's all say it together. Father, do great things in the world so that everyone will know who you are and honor you. Cause all people to know that you are God through your mighty acts which display your character. Glorify your name through your people. May others come to know you through our witness. May your name be set apart above all others. For you alone are holy and worthy of prayers. Bring forth the final day when every knee will bow and rightfully glorify your name. Your name be hallowed, set apart as holy, lifted up, glorified, honored, exalted, magnified. And then finally, act in the world 
Show everyone that you are alive. Make known your power and your character. May we all come to honor and glorify you. Heavenly Father, just hear these prayers as we're lifting them up to you. For you to do all of these things in our midst and through us and for us. That you will come in power among LMC. You will come in power in this room even today to accomplish your purposes. And to bring glory to your name. And to let others know who you are so that they may also participate in the blessed privilege of glorifying and lifting you up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Finally this morning, and very briefly, let me just share with you the hallowing pro how the hallowing process involves the coming of the kingdom of God. So we've got the three steps of the hallowing process. Just to review, I'm a teacher. I like to review things, okay? So God acts. God is made known through God's people. Those who see will come to know God and acknowledge God's greatness. What I want to say here is steps one and two, God's acting for us and through us, is what the coming of the kingdom is all about. Or to say it another way, it is when the kingdom comes that God's name is glorified and hallowed. This is how God acts in the world, to bring forth his kingdom in our midst. So these two first petitions of the Lord's Prayer are connected to each other. They're related to each other. They're intertwined with each other as we understand how we pray this. Uh, and so, for instance, um, to give you an example of this, Father, hallowed be your name as you bring forth your kingdom in this world. The one accomplishes the other. Or if we use the active voice, Father, hallow your name as you bring forth your kingdom in this world. So thank you for letting me share some teaching here with you this morning. We are going to go to table groups now. And there's uh, a paper on your tables, I, I believe for each one of you to have one. And there are eight different items that you can look at there. And you may feel free to choose which ones you focus on, which ones you spend your time on. And I believe, Keith, we're going until 12. 15 minutes you're going to have for table discussion, so I invite your participation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For your it is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. As, as William was teaching, I just had this strong sense that there was there were things that were being imparted or stirred deeply in people's hearts um, uh, that uh, maybe some of the rest of us need to hear. Um, and uh, I know that somebody came to me, so I, need to, I know there's at least one thing that was stirred in that context. But before we go there, is there anything that you sensed that you'd be willing to share with the whole? Not a sermon. These are, these are like, uh, not like Keith, but these are like 15 second, 30 second sound bites of what stirred in your heart as you were sitting with or processing uh, the, this, this uh, teaching from William. And I won't wait too long, but yeah, Mark. In an election year. <laughs> and this is going to be 15 seconds. No. <laughs> In an election no, 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 year, fine. that's four words, I get <laughs> This is the gospel. I'll let people come up and say a short time, and then I'll talk longer about things. No, it won't necessarily. I, I do believe that God is raising up the church to be in a new place, and he's using things like elections to invite us to a new way of being linked to God, hallowed be your name, and he will instruct us. Do not be afraid. Others.
Yeah, I'm Jonathan Bornman. I was especially struck by the brief teaching from Exodus 36 about uh, Israel had profaned God's name. And I just felt a strong unction that we need to wrestle with how we have profaned God's name and how that affects our witness. Could you just pray that over us, just a prayer on our behalf? Sure. Yeah, Father, in a corporate sense of the church, there's many cases and many ways that we have profaned your name. Mm -hmm. And it has greatly harmed our witness. Mm -hmm. We confess the sinfulness of that. Mm -hmm. We ask you to restore us. Make us people who might reveal your glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Others? Hi, my name is Colin Pfeiffer, uh, lead elder at Old Red Mennonite Church, um, down past White Horse towards Honeybrook. Um, some of, during the first thing, talk about the kingdom, as well as during the second, talk about how would be his name. I got this image of um, the Lord standing beside a bath. And he's inviting us to come and be clean and cleaned in the bath water. And yet some of us, when we are being invited, are saying, no, not I. Because I know my dirt, I know my filth, and I know that I'm going to dirty up the water. And so I'm stepping back and saying no. And some of us are doing it because of the fear of becoming clean. Some of us are doing it for the fear of dirtying up the water. And then those that will come after us we'll have to clean the dirty water. But the reality is that you can't make God unholy. It doesn't matter how far your dirt is, his holiness is pure and cleanses us no matter what. There's no getting rid of the dirty bath water because there is no dirty bath water. It's just cleanliness. And so when we say, hallowed be his name, and yet pull away, he's saying, no, I need you to step forward and become clean because to do that, to step into that, is where my name will be hallowed. Seeing that change, I'm getting off the pulpit. <laughs> yeah, that would preach, Cohen. <laughs> I had to wrestle with the spirit there for a minute. Thank you for that, because that leads into where our table was at. Um, I don't know how many of you all wrestled with question five. Your name. Oh, yes. My name is uh, Pastor Stephen from Boston Mennonite Church. I don't know how many of you all wrestled with question five. That was the one that jumped out for me. I feel like I'm in a spirit of lament as a pastor for myself, for my congregation. So changing that to being in a spirit of all. And my mind went back to a conflict in our congregation and how God was glorified through that. Wow. And the word that came from our ta table was, don't hurry the mess. Don't hurry the mess. I feel like, <laughs> man, we could be in a spirit of discomfort. Don't hurry the mess because that's when God is glorified. So that's the word. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Snyder from Maranatha Church in the Holy Lands of Pennsylvania. <laughs> that would be that would be Nazareth, okay. Yeah. How would be that name? No. <laughs> Amen. Real briefly, so Exodus 33, when, when Moses says, show me your glory, and he says, all right, go hide in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand. And you're not going to see my face, but you're going to see my back. And I was reminded of a young mentor, somebody I was mentoring years ago, uh, young in the Lord asked the question, what did Moses see? And I wonder if he saw the ripped open back of Jesus. And, and in the context of this, like God's glory is shown through our suffering in the same way that in the suffering of Jesus, God's glory was manifest. Yeah. So it just makes me wonder, like, how does he really want us to proclaim his glory? Sometimes it may th be through his suffering. Thank you, Jim. And again, that one preaches and uh, isn't particularly popular in our culture. 
uh, I've now got the pastors flowing up to the front here, and J J James will be the last one for now. Um, uh, so you have the, you don't have the last word, but you have the word. <laughs> no, I just wanted to remind everyone what I've been going through. Uh, I preach at uh, Parksburg Mennonite Church. Um, grow where you're planted. And whatever that means in your context, apply it. Grow where you're planted. Amen. Word. The context of invitation in the place where you've been planted that uh, might have conflicts that actually become the opportunity for God's glory to be revealed. Now, this was all activated, though I sent something by our dear brother, Bishop Louis Cabamba. Louis, if you want to come forward wherever you've gone to, there he is. I thought you were hiding behind the, in the ox cart or whatever it was over there. But uh, we're going to transition very soon to lunch, unless uh, Bishop Cabamba starts with a sermon. Um, <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay. It's, there, there will be no lunch today. It will be fasting. <laughs> Come on. Give me a praise the Lord, a good one. Praise the Lord. Amen to that. As a brother William, God bless you. God bless you uh, for this message. And uh, what I'm asking, what the Lord has put in my heart, I was listening to this message is for us to worship God. But we're gonna worship him by giving. Because what I receive to this message is a blessing. I don't wanna leave this place without giving to God for what I receive. So I came to uh, my elder bishop, I said, please, can you just give me five minutes to share with whoever wanna worship God right now? So I'm gonna ask somebody to help me with a basket you're not going to be standing, but uh, yeah, they said those two servants over there. Can we help me with basket, please? <laughs> so you're not going to be standing. Just reflect in the message, in the spirit of worship, and then tell God, this is what I'm giving to you. Because this place, we need to glorify him. Amen? Amen. Can we do that? I don't know if uh, they can sing us one song and then as we're giving our basket. Or I would just invite you to stand. Yes. I, I, I'm sure there's a way to give digitally, Mindy. Uh, on the website, lmcchurches.org. You can find a giving tab. Huh? Oh, slash donate. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I said slash their name. I'm like, what? <laughs> You're out. <laughs> let's, just, let's just stand together to worship the Lord. And uh, Rodney and Adalberto will be going through. You've got your phone. And again, one of the things Lewis said to me, so this is part of the beauty of going cross cultures. There's different ways we engage with this. Some of us as anglers are like threatened sometimes when they're like, oh, they're pushing us to give or whatever. And uh, then some of our brothers and sisters from other places are like, why would you not ask to give? It's our opportunity. It's a way that we can worship. But there's a lot of ways we can worship. And so let's just, let's just join and worship the Lord together. Those baskets will be coming around and we will just delight in the Lord. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the words that hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul.
standing in the presence of the Lord. Uh, I was dropping money on the way up, which is, a, I think, a good thing. Um, but that sense inside that this represents the provision of God, that we are people who are going to walk in faith, trusting the one who called us to provide what's needed. What we need more than money, though, is faith. Faith to believe that the one who called us will direct and guide us. I just invite you to lift your hands up. I'm going to lift this up and try not to drop any money and just close with prayer and then prayer for the meal. Lord, we thank you for provision. But we confess that as Americans, we think the almighty dollar is where, is where ministry and everything else starts. And we confess that our trust is not in the almighty dollar. Though we thank you for every provision you give us. Our trust is in you and you alone, Lord. And so we say, open up the coffers of provision, whatever that might be, so that what you're stirring in our heart, provision for the new, would start in us. That would we, we would be transformed, each one of us, to a new place of encounter. That that intercession for hallowed be your name would result in a transforming work of a hallowing of our lives because of your presence living in us. So we say thank you for this time. We thank you for this precious, precious receiving from you, particularly from the, the word from William and from the prophetic words released in our midst from brothers and sisters here acknowledging there's probably many more. But we say, Lord, continue to speak to us. And now as we go to the meal, to time of fellowship, May your name be honored, hallowed by our conversations, by the inspiration, by the way we bless one another, pray for one another, exhort one another, and see your body build up in us, among us, so that you might receive all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.